Yes, Lord. Mm. Amen. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be in church this evening. Lord, I pray for Brother Gip, uh, who's been a blessing to our church, and Brother Grady. Pray for their ministries. Father, I pray for the men and uh, that have been on my heart this uh, through the week. You know them. Lord, I want to lift up to you Elizabeth and, and Brendan, Lord, during this time. And uh, Father, I don't know what's going on. I don't know... Um, where she is right now but all i know is you're the father of um, miracles and you could touch her body and she could be healed clean from this cancer but lord if not help her family lord to deal with um, everything and everything that they're going through you know their emotions and uh, you know the feelings uh, that they're feeling right now and i pray that you comfort them in in all of this i lift up to you um our church thank you for the ability to be in this area, Father, I pray that you continue to bless us, that you use us, Lord, to be a blessing to people over here and uh, to be a lighthouse to our community. Thank you for each and every one that are here. And thank you for your goodness, your grace, your wisdom, love, and understanding. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Um, open your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter number one. I'm not dressed up. I came out earlier and I cleaned the church a little bit and swept and did some stuff so that's my excuse afterwards i just decided i'm not gonna i'm not gonna get changed so sorry but not really <laughs> don't care i love hearing that it's all right pastor thank you thank you yeah as long as my shirt is even and the buttons are not off right <laughs> exodus chapter number one we uh, spent a lot of time in the book of Genesis, and the book of Genesis co covers a span of over 2,000 years. Then we come into the book of Exodus, and uh, I want you to see in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 1, you start off with, in the beginning, who knows that one? In the beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God, no, that's John 1 1. The heavens and the earth. Wonderful. So you start off with life in the book of Genesis. And then what's interesting is if you go back a page and you see Genesis chapter number 50 and verse 26, someone read that. Genesis 50 verse 26, the last verse in the book of Genesis. Okay, you start off with life and you end with death, the book of Genesis. You end with a coffin. That's what sin does. You start off with life and God brings life and then in the middle of it or at the end of it, uh, when man gets involved, death happens. And so we see the end of the book of Genesis, um, death is very prominent. And uh, then we look at Exodus chapter number 1. And uh, they're still in Egypt. They've been in Egypt for about 420 years now. And look at uh, Exodus chapter number 1 and verse 8. The Bible says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. The focus of uh, the Old Testament is the Messiah, really, and uh, the Redeemer that's to come. And uh, really the focus is the Old Testament is setting it up for the, the, the New Testament, for the Redeemer to come and for a way of salvation to come to us, to the Gentiles. And then, or um, to, well, to, to Israel it was supposed to be, but Israel rejected the Savior, but uh, the, the Redeemer. But what ends up happening is um, it's all there to bring a way of salvation, 
Christ came so that he can have fellowship again, so we can have fellowship again with him. And the importance of all of this in history is uh, if, if that Pharaoh knew about history, he would know that the Jews were loyal to Egypt. Okay, the Jews were loyal to Egypt. And then the second part of that is he would have known that um, what, what the Jews did for Egypt. You know, I'm, I'm reading Dr. Garidi's book, and in his book he writes and, and he quotes a guy who says, the, Jew, the, the, Jewish, the Jewish people are hated because they can make money. You look at Times Square and you look at how they could um, make a ton of cash how they're running Wall Street. They make money, the Jews. They could be in any place in the world and they're, they're just blessed of the Lord. And um, that's what they did when they came to Egypt. They were a blessing to the Egyptians, but the, the Pharaoh didn't know, the Pharaoh didn't know what Joseph and his family did for Egypt. And uh, this is what is sad. Pharaoh didn't know about God. And now look at this. Go to Exodus chapter number one again, and, and verse number or chapter number two. Sorry, chapter number two and verse number one. Rob, can you read that chapter two and verse one? Okay, and the woman conceived, verse 2, and bare a son. And so this is Moses now. This is Moses. And all throughout the life of Moses, you never read of God in the, the first time Moses appears. You don't read of God being prominent in the life of, uh, in the life of Moses. You don't read of God being in the life of his father. You don't read of God being in the life of his mother. You just read of Moses being there. Right? And then another thing is, uh, there are some people that feared God. You read in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, there were two midwives that feared God, but Israel doesn't even remember God. Look at the end of chapter number 2. Um, Uncle Boy, can you read chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2, and verse number, verse number 23? Side. Okay, so they're crying, but they, they don't know who they're crying to. They're complaining and, and they're tired of all the work, but God didn't forget Israel. Israel forgot God. They, the, you don't read of Israel or the Bible saying that Israel prayed to God, but you read of God hearing their cry. And then you read in uh, verse number 24, um, Auntie Darlin, go ahead and read verse 24. Okay, and, and go ahead and read verse 25. Okay, they weren't looking for God. They weren't looking for God. God went looking for them. And so he sees that his people have a problem. He sees that his people are struggling and they're hurting. And it hurts God so much that this is what he does. He turns around and he finds a leader. And I believe this. He starts looking around and looking around and seeing and there are people that are there that could be leaders and I believe that he calls them. He says, I want to use you. And they say, to do what, Lord? And the Lord says, I want to use you to lead Israel out of Egypt. And the moment that they heard that, this is what you hear. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't say it in the Bible, but I'm just saying I believe. Okay, I believe that God called people and there are some people that reject the calling of God. And finally, he gets to Moses. Okay, This is speculation on my part. This is not gospel. <laughs> Okay, this is speculation on my part. And you get into the life of Moses. So chapter number 2 sums up the life of Moses. Moses' life, okay, uh, let's go straight to Moses. Moses' life 
is summed up, or the first 80 years of his life is summed up in one chapter. Moses' first 80 years is summed up in one chapter, chapter number two. And he grew up um, differently from a lot of people. If you read chapter number two, you'll see that his life was at risk. He should have died. But uh, his mom had an aspect of faith. She saved him. How did she save him? Send him down the river. He did have a cup of coffee. Send him down the river. She put him down the river in a boat made of slime, pretty much. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really trust a boat made of slime, right? Being held together by pitch. Okay, uh, I I don't I don't um, I wouldn't trust that. But she had faith, and the Lord took care of Moses. And why was he called Moses? Because he drew him out of the water. Because the the Pharaoh's daughter drew him out of the water. So he grew up in Pharaoh's house. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. He grew up in royalty, but he knew his Jewish roots. You say why? Because nearing the end of his time in Egypt, after 40 years in Egypt, he is not close with the Egyptians. Comes to a place where he knows he's a Jew. He knows it. And so he fled, he fleed, fleeds, fleds. I can't even get the words right. He flees Egypt. And uh, he goes to Midian. The Bible says in verse 16, now the priest of Midian ends up being his father-in-law. He goes by different names, Ruel, Jethro. He goes by uh, uh, numerous names. The priest of Midian comes into play and he marries this guy's daughter. So I want you to see this. His father-in-law was a religious man. His father-in-law was a priest. He was religious. His father-in-law was also a good, uh, uh, I wouldn't say good, but he was a parent. He was an, an, an enabler. Why do you say that? Look at chapter number 3 and verse 1. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, that's his father-in-law, in the, land, um, the, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So Moses starts working for his father-in-law. Okay, And then you read of the calling of Moses. Okay, So let's just skip to that. And I want to talk about Moses, and I want to give you this tonight. The calling of God, His will for your life. You say, why? Because I see Christians all the time that are looking for God's calling in their life. I see people all the time that are looking for, what does God want me to do? How can I be successful in life? Where should I go? What should I do? Right? You hear people all the time saying, what is God's will for me specifically? Where does it say in the Bible? We always think it's going to be that, infomer- that infomercial. I can't even speak tonight. The infomercial, right? It's Robert. He's got the words. He stole the words from me. But we always think of those infomercials. We think that uh, an infomercial is going to pop up in the internet or on the TV and it's going to say, hey, are you Robert Espanol? Are you living in Mauna Loa, Hawaii? Do you love the Lord? Well, you should buy my product. <laughs> there you go. We think that's the will of God. It should be plain and blatant. Right? But it's not always that way. And Moses, what he's doing is he becomes complacent. Check out this. Chapter number 3 and verse number... 16. Chapter number 2, sorry. Go back to chapter number 2 and verse number 21. Timati, can you read that? And Moses was content to dwell with the men. See? Let's just stop there. Moses was content. Moses starts working for his father-in-law and he comes to a place of contentment. Okay? He comes to a place where he's all right. 221. Okay? He comes to a place in his life where he's all right. You know, he's not succeeding in life. He's not doing anything great, so to say. But he's not doing anything bad. He's in a place where he's happy. Yeah. Um... You ever get to those places where you think to yourself, Lord, don't change anything. (laughs) Please. I love this routine. I love getting up at the same time every day. I love doing all of these things the way it's going. I'm enjoying my schedule. I'm enjoying the amount of money that I'm making. It's not much. It's not terrible. It's not great. It's just right. This is perfect. This is where I need to stay, Lord. 
<laughs> you ever get to those places in life where you think, to you, this is the will of God for me. I'm doing everything I need to do because everything is perfect. This is my bubble. And, and right, it, how long does it last? Not very long. Not very long. <laughs> That's the funny thing is it's not, it doesn't last forever. And Moses is in this place of contentment for 40 years. He's on the backside of the desert taking care of his father-in-law's things. And look, God calls him when he's 80 years old. Okay? The Lord called me when I was at the sweet and tender age of 24 <laughs> to come over here and pastor church. Okay? Uh, a lot of people said, you're too young. A lot of, a lot of people said, you're, you're not going to make it. I'm barely making it, but I'm making it. All right? And people made fun when, when I said I was coming out here. People didn't think I would make it. But I knew the Lord was calling me here. Now imagine if, Uncle Boy, you're 80 years old and the Lord looks at you and says, I want you to move your whole family and your whole life to India. Hallelujah. And I want, you to, I want you to preach the gospel in India. Yeah, right, we, right. Right, we say that now. Yahoo! You know, you get excited and you think to yourself, when it really settles in, I'm going to charge hell with a squirt gun. I'm going to go and lead all these people to the Lord. You see all these young people that graduate Bible college? They graduate Bible college and they're so happy because they, they know everything, right? <laughs> okay, let's just, say, let's just say high school then. You see, all these people, these young people that graduate high school, they're 18 years old, and they know everything, right? They're seniors, and they know everything until they pay their first electrical bill, as Tim Hawkins says, right? They pay their first electrical bill, and they know nothing. But they come to a place where they know everything in life, and then they're, they move out, and they start living in their own, and they, the first six months is horrible. Why? Because they're, they, they weren't ready for that aspect of life. And uh, that's the thing that happens is we get so excited, we get so pumped up, and we get into it, and then all of a sudden, we start questioning, man, is this really what God wants me to do for the rest of my life, live in India? Right? Uncle Boy, I think the first part of it, you'll, you'll get excited and you'll think to yourself, man, this is wonderful. This is God's calling for my life. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to do it. And then I believe maybe 10 years into it, you're going to think, this is horrible. Why am I even here? Does God even want me here? You know, numerous times in Moses' ministry, he thought to himself, Lord, I want to kill these people. And the Lord just says, you know, Moses, it's all right. Just calm down. Just stay calm. And then there were times where the Lord says, Moses, let's just kill these people. I'll just destroy each and every one of them and we'll start new with you. And Moses turns to the Lord and says, oh God, you already promised you're going to keep these people, Lord. <laughs> right? The Lord wanted to change his mind a few times, and I believe that's what happens in our lives. We, we hit, you know, you, you hear this all the time, midlife crisis, <laughs> right? You come to a place where you're just not happy where God has you. And Moses doesn't come to that place. Moses, he's 40 years in the wilderness, and, and the Lord looks at him, and the Lord shakes up his contentment. What does the Lord do? Um, Uncle Boy, can you read chapter 3 and verse 3, please? Chapter 3 and verse 3. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see the great sight. Why the host is not there? Okay. So the Lord shows himself to Moses by way of a burning bush. That's not burning. When the Lord wants to get your attention, He'll do some wonderful things. My teacher, my high school teacher, moved up to Canada, and she said she moved up to Canada, and she knew it was the last straw when she was at a baseball game. I think it was a baseball game. It was some kind of game. And she was sitting in the crowd, and she was praying, Lord, should I go to Canada or not? And someone all of a sudden stood up and started singing the Canadian National Anthem. She never heard the Canadian National Anthem in her life. And at that very moment, she hears someone sing the Canadian National Anthem. And she turned and she said, okay, Lord, I'm going to Canada. <laughs> right? Sometimes the Lord is going to do phenomenal things to get your attention. He goes by reason of a burning bush. It started to rain, right? That's what he says at the beginning of the... 
<laughs> tonight. He said, the Lord gave me a sign. It started to rain. So the Lord is giving you a sign, Brother Rob. But look at chapter number 3. And I'll read verse number 4. Brother Rob, if you could get verse number 4. And then Auntie Darlin, if you can read verse number 5. Go ahead, Brother Rob. Chapter 3, verse 4, and then Auntie Darlin, verse number 5. You know, the first time holy appears in your Bible, it has to do with the ground. It has to do with dirt. Where does man come from? The dust of the ground. What is he essentially saying? He's saying, you can't come to me your way. You cannot worship me your way. You need to come my way. And so the first thing is when God calls you, you need humility. Humility. Why did God call Moses? Why did God call Moses? The Bible says that he was the meekest man who ever lived. That he was powerful, but he kept his power under control. He was very humble. You say, how do you know that? It takes humility to be working for your father-in-law and be happy. (laughs) It takes humility because he's an Egyptian. We saw this last night. Or when was it? A few nights ago, I think we talked about the abomination of the Egyptians. The Egyptians, they looked at shepherds and they say, shepherds, they're nasty. They're gross, right? We looked at that. When did we look at that? I think it was last Sunday. (laughs) Anyways, shepherds, shepherds, Egyptians don't like shepherds. And culturally, Moses was an Egyptian. He was royalty. And that means you're going from kingship all the way down to the, not even the bottom. There's the bottom, and then there's a whole bunch of crap, and then there's the shepherd. That's how the Egyptians look at shepherds. They say, no, that's gross, that's nasty. I'm not doing that job at all. But Moses steeps down to that level and becomes a shepherd. He's a very humble man. And so the first thing that you need, if if God is going to call you, He's going to call you because you're humble. My pastor used to say all the time when we were growing up, um, you're humble until you know it. When you start thinking, man, I'm humble. (laughs) then you're not, right? The first thing that God needs from you is humility. Meaning, when you got saved, you had to say, man, I'm not good enough to deserve or get heaven. Right? You had to say, I'm not good enough, but God, He is good. And you had to trust on the righteousness of Christ. The second thing you need is a heartbeat. (laughs) You know what I love? Is God still uses manpower. He says, it's our job to go out and preach the gospel and teach the gospel to every nation, right? You know what he could do? He could go down to Kalau Papa and he could whisper into the ears of one of those mules and say, I want you to preach the gospel. And that mule can turn around and preach the gospel and everybody's going to hear and know about the talking mule in Kalau Papa. What's he saying? He's talking about Jesus. And then everyone from all over the world would come to see the talking mule who's preaching the gospel. But God doesn't operate like that. He still uses manpower. He still needs you. You say, I can't do anything for God. Do this. Everybody, do this. You did that? You're still with me? Okay, God can use you. (laughs) You still have breath and you still have a heartbeat. God can use you. Okay? And that's what he's telling Moses. Moses comes up with every excuse in the book. He says, I don't even know how to talk. I I stutter. I I, 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 I can't do it, Lord. He says, who made the mouth? I don't have any ability to do what you're calling me to do. The Lord says, I'm not interested in your abilities. I'll take your inabilities and make you better than who you are. Right? And Moses comes to a place where he realizes God just needs, you know how, you know what God needs? He just needs one. If tomorrow the Lord says, all right, Pastor Ram, 
smacks me upside my head, I fall over and died, and the church is just here. It would have been all right. You say, why? Look at what he's done already. Right? The Lord doesn't need me, guys. It's essentially what I'm saying is we need him. Okay? So here's how we know the call of God in our life. First of all, is we need humility. Second of all, we need a heartbeat. Third, we need holiness. Holiness. And I could go on and on about that, but uh, you read in verse, uh, chapter number 3 and verse number 5, the place where thou standest is holy ground. The last thing is He needs you to listen. He needs you to hear Him out. He gave Moses a game plan and He told Moses how He's going to capture and conquer Egypt and get the people out of Egypt and go into the promised land. And Moses said, no one's going to listen to me. And God says, all you need to do is go. Finally, he gets the Lord upset and the Lord says, go. And it's interesting that Moses ends up turning around and, and just going. I don't think Moses had the right heart when he went. I don't think that they were on the same page when Moses left. Look at uh, chapter number 4. Go to chapter number 4. Chapter number 4. In verse number 13. Okay? Look at this. Chapter number 4 and verse number 13. And he said, O Lord, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Okay? Um, short of it, Lord, send, me so, send someone else. That's the short version. Look at verse 14. Um, Auntie Maddie, can you read that, please? Okay, so now this is, what, this is what ends up happening. The Lord gets mad and says, I've given you everything. Just go. Just go. And you don't hear of Moses speaking another word. He goes back to his father-in-law. He hands in his two weeks. <laughs> he goes and he meets his brother. And this is what I want you to see is there is no security. There's no security. Meaning, he left everything that he knew and everything that he loved. Because essentially, he leaves his wife. He leaves everything he knows, everything he's, he loves, and everything that he's satisfied with. Remember we read that word, content? And he goes to a place that he doesn't want to go. Remember last time he was in Egypt, he killed a guy? He has to face that. Remember last time in Egypt, he was running away? He has to face everything he ran away from. And he goes back to a place where he doesn't even want to be. Right? And God says, no. You're going to Egypt and you're doing it my way. And there is no guarantees. It's just like, uh, I always say it's just like a, a family. I see all the time people running around and say, I'm going to raise good children. You, you ever see those young couples? Not, not my kids. It's the, the, the words I always laugh at. They always say, my kids aren't going to be like those ones. My cousin said that when she was pregnant. She said, nope, we're going to make it where they memorize Scripture every week. That's what she said. And they did good. They, they, they did memorize Scripture. Not every week, though. It's a struggle. It's work. Um, people always think they're going to raise good kids and they're going to be great. And they're going to turn around and say, look, look at my kids. This is the prime example of how children should be. You, you read that verse? Children obey your parents and the Lord? Yeah, Psst, look at them, right? But there are no guarantees. You serve the Lord? Let me say these guys. There is 
There's no guarantee. And really, you're going to get your heart broken. You're going to look at the Lord and a lot of times and you're going to say, why, Lord? <laughs> why would you call me to this place, this barren place, Molokai? There's no McDonald's, Lord. They don't even have a Costco. Friendly market. It cost me an arm and a leg to shop there. Right? But all he's concerned about is go. What did Moses not see? If you go back to chapter number 2, and uh, Rob read that, but verse 23 to 25, this is what Moses did not see. The Bible says in Exodus chapter number 2 and verse number 23, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. What did Moses not see? He didn't see Israel's pain. He didn't see their suffering. See, God sees a lot of things from a different perspective. And a lot of times He sees His children suffering over here. And maybe He wants to take us from our contentment and put us over here so that we could minister to other people. What does God need? God just needs you to put your head down and say, yes, Lord. The most important word you'll ever say in your life is yes, Lord. And it might not be in the right attitude at the time, but all he's looking for is yes, Lord. And once you come to that place where you say, yes, Lord, what happens? He goes out and God gives him what he needs. He gives him Aaron. You step out in faith and you live by faith. God is going to give you everything. Everything that you need. Uncle Boy, pray for us this evening. <laughs>